I have finally managed to sit down and watch episode one of Arcane season two, and I'm so late to the party, but here we are. Spoilers, I thought it was very good. Keep in mind, I've still not watched episode two at the time of recording, and there are spoilers in this video for episode one, so do keep that in mind. Do not watch this if you have yet to watch it yourself. On with the video. The episode opens directly where we left off in season one, and we witness the aftermath of Jinx's attack on the council, and things are not looking good for our Piltover overlords. Three of the six councillors are dead, Victor is nearly dead, and Jace and Mel seem to be the only two that are coming out of this pretty much okay, at least physically. Jace actually mentions this later in the episode, and Mel says there's no sense to these kind of things, which implies that they were just lucky to not get hurt. I thought, and there was some speculation about this back in 2021, that Mel had some sort of Solari power and that we were going to see that, but no, uh, we just got lucky with Mel and Jace, which is good because they're both fantastic characters, although some people might chalk this up to plus armor, but I think it's fine. Either way, this event is the catalyst for the central theme of the episode, which is grief, or more specifically, how the cast are dealing with their grief, and by the end of the episode, we have a lot of different characters in a lot of different places, emotionally speaking. There's a psychology model called the seven stages of grief, which tries to explain the emotions that you feel when you're going through grief, and this isn't a psychology lecture, but ultimately, you bounce around this thing like crazy when you're going through grief, and this episode encompasses that so well. Grief is chaotic and if you have ever felt grief in real life then you'll know what that feels like and you'll know that this episode does a really good job of encompassing the unpredictability and chaotic feeling that comes with grief perfectly. Caitlin is all over the place in this episode. She's a fantastic example of this. She feels pain for the loss of her mother and anger against those who she deems responsible. She feels guilt for not taking the shot against Jinx when she could have done and she directly references how easy it's become to hate all of Zorn. How easy it is to hate them. One vicious act despite her knowing that they aren't all to blame. She is all over the seven stages of grief right now. Vi is similar, though she spends far more time racking with her own guilt, and that's where she spends most of her time, as she kind of blames herself for creating the monster in the first place. And Jace is mostly sitting in shock, like struggling with the event, and his denial to accept Victor's death in the council room leads him to try and save Victor in his lab, which leads to infusing Victor with his hex core. He is grieving but he keeps his own anger in check as he refuses to offer Hextech weapons for fear of innocence being caught in the crossfire. He does not want to use Hextech as a weapon, nor does Mel for that matter. And really the first half of the episode is about all these different characters coming to terms with their grief, whatever stage they happen to be in, and moving towards that upwards turn, you know, that upward swing where they've made sense of it, they've rationalized it in their head, and they've logically defined a way forward. And it's almost like at that scene where Mel steps up to the podium to give her speech that the main cast are all together and they're unified in a way. They're at that upward turn by working through their issues together and starting to make sense of what the cause of that grief was. Which is to say, one deranged individual is to blame rather than the entire nation of Zorn. But just as the main cast have kind of rationalized that and just as they're trying to convince the rest of Piltover that that is also the case and to in turn try to heal the rest of Piltover, Zorn attacks. The shock of this puts everything right back to where they started and they find themselves once again stuck in the pits of grief. They were so close to getting out and the rest of the episode is just the main cast absolutely encompassed with anger and doing things that we know as viewers are against their better nature. We've seen it in season one what their better nature is, but they cannot contain the anger. And by the end of the episode, a lot of the main characters are almost in an opposite state or they're on the opposite side of where they started as a result of not being able to reconcile that anger. Caitlin starts this episode by saying an invasion of Zorn is out of the question because it would hurt innocent bystanders. And by the end of the episode, she's demanding the council let her lead the attack on Zorn with the full might of the enforcers to essentially dismantle the Undersea. She pulls out a Hextech rifle, which in this point in the timeline is an ultra powerful weapon that has no equal. This is a Caitlyn that is fueled by vengeance. And Jace starts the episode starkly against the use of Hextech as a weapon, as I've mentioned. But by the end of it, he's crafting those weapons himself. And he's arming his friends and their allies, people he doesn't even know, like the new characters like Maddie, with insanely powerful tools so they can go and exact that vengeance. And Vi, I'll come back to Vi actually. Even new characters like Maddie I just mentioned, who are introduced as these kind of optimistic and hopeful, you know, the future of Piltover, maybe the future of Piltover, this new hope kind of thing, they find themselves ready to go to war by the end of the episode as well. This girl, Maddie, the look on her face at the end of the episode is not the look on her face that we had at the start of the episode. Anger has transformed these people into monsters. 
because of what Zorn did to them. But there's an irony here, because the attack on Zorn at this pivotal moment in Piltover's healing process where Mel's up on the podium, is the result of Zorn not being able to deal with their own grief in the first place. One of the attackers in that scene, when Jace is on the floor and she's got the chainsaw over his face, she says, for my son. For my son. And in that moment, I remembered what we saw in season one. Jace stood over the body of a young child in Zorn after Piltover attacked the Shimmer Factory. That kid was her son, and I forgot that happened. Because in all of the dealings of Piltover and watching all of them struggle, I forgot that Zorn was struggling too, and the main cast have done exactly that. They've forgotten that Zorn suffered a similar misjustice at the hands of Piltover just days ago in the Arcane story. So where is Vi in all of this? She's unique. She's both parts of the coin. She's on her own journey. But in one of the final shots of the episode where we see our enforcers all lined up, very cool shot by the way, they're ready to take on Zorn. And Vi does stand amongst them as an enforcer, but she has noticeably less conviction than the rest of the squad. And I believe that's because she's one of the few characters who hasn't really changed their position over the course of the episode. Everyone is angry, but I don't think Vi is. I think Vi is still just trying to deal with the guilt of creating the monster and feels obligated to sign up as a way to deal with that guilt whilst trying to keep her friends, like Caitlyn, safe from the monster that she feels that she's created. Vi is not ready for war in this episode. I don't think so anyway. That's that's how I see it. I cannot state enough how fantastic I thought this episode was. It circumvented and exceeded all expectations I had for it. And episode two is just around. The, I'm going to watch it tonight, so I'm very excited for it. There was some other cool stuff, actually, like outside of the general just overarching theme of the episode being very good and them telling that very well. There's a few little side things going on uh, that were quite interesting. My favourite being Ambessa. We see right at the start of the episode, Ambessa trying to manipulate Piltover to get behind an attack on Zorn, though she's obviously miffed when Hextech is ruled out as a weapon by her daughter Mel. This ties to Ambessa's character motivations really well throughout season one, which essentially boils down to her laying low from Noxus whilst looking for weapons. Later in the episode, when Zorn attacks Piltover, we see Noxus come to the rescue just in time, though there is a comment made by Mel, I think it was that Zorn must have had help in order to infiltrate the event and launch their attack unseen. And the only character I think it could be is Ambessa. She stands to benefit from Piltover and Zorn going head to head in all-out war. It weakens both nations for a possible future invasion from Noxus, which we know Noxus likes to do, and pushes both sides to create weapons that she can take back to Noxus for their war machine. Perhaps for an upcoming invasion of Ionia, maybe. We do know that Noxus eventually gets its hand on Chemtech because they use it against the Wuju in Ionia. So maybe it was Ambessa who brought this technology back to Motherland and now we're seeing that play out in real time in Arcane. Who, who knows? The other remarkably cool moment, and this kind of goes without saying, is just Singed rolling up on some Merc Wolves at the end of the episode. Presumably because all the theories of him creating Warwick from the remains of Vanda are becoming true. It's unclear where he is in this scene though. There's snow, so presumably the Freylord, but the Freylord's pretty far away from Zorn. Uh, so I'm not sure if Singe could have journeyed all that way in this time. Unless maybe like there's, he's taken a sun gate or something maybe. Um, but there is a pretty tall mountain just north of Piltover. So I guess snow on the Great Barrier Mountains confirmed. The environmental storytelling is also just incredible. Incredibly, I'm just gushing now. There's no, this. I'm not even. I haven't even got bullet points for this. I'm just talking. <laughs> All right. But we get this. I, I saw this. I remember we got this shot uh, about it was Caitlin's great grandmother posing against what looked like an Ionian backdrop, um, which had like purple or red grass. So I can't remember. And also in the episode, we have Caitlin in their garden and there's a very Ionian looking tree there. And so it's telling us as the viewers that the Kiramans are still at least a bit in touch with their ancestry in some way, but they haven't told us that. It's just all visual storytelling. And I just think that's, that's so good. And Arcane was really good at that in season one. And I'm so pleased that in season two, they're doing exactly the same thing. It's so, it's so good. Oh, and one last thing. There's also this shot of the globe at around the 34 minute mark. This shows roughly how big Valoran is. We've known there's something to the east for a while now. Uh, we got that in the Ruination book. There's a map of it. But I always had this personal theory in my head that the map that we knew was just a part of the world and that we actually had stuff to the south of the map as well, maybe even to the west of the map on account of it being a desert to the south and those typically being found at the equator in the real world. But this globe puts Piltover roughly on the equator line and so there isn't really any space there to be anything below Shreema. So I guess that the world is as tall as the map that we have. We know there's stuff to the east based on the size of that globe. I suspect that the stuff we know to the east is probably all there is unless they're going to wreck on that map in the future which they very well could do but either way it was really really cool to see like the map of ionia sorry the map of runeterra on a real globe because then you can kind of measure kind of how much space there is to work with you know um so yeah all in all fantastic episode loved it did i miss anything from season two episode one 
Uh, I've not watched the second episode yet, so do not tell me about anything in episode two, please. But if there's anything I missed from episode one, do let me know. It was so good. My God, it was good. <laughs> anyway, that's all for this. Thank you for listening to me gush over Arcane for like 10 minutes. Um, it was fantastic. Have a fantastic day, and I will maybe do another one of these for episode two. I don't know. Uh, probably, because it's going to be equally good, no doubt. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.